Hi and welcome to the We Are Zion Sermon Podcast. We are a local church based here in Chennai, India. I'm Christine, your host. We are so glad you are here and our hope is that this will encourage, inspire and instill fresh faith in you. We continue with our series on Only Jesus. Here's Christine Geshom with today's message. So it's so good to see you, Church, on Resurrection Sunday. Wishing each of you a very happy Easter. It's a very different Easter, obviously. Uh, nothing like we've had before, confined to home. Uh, we don't get to dress up and go out and meet friends. But um, nonetheless, we're going to make the most of it. Um, we're going to end our series today, the Only Jesus series. Uh, we're ending it on a note where we end it with hope because our hope is found in Jesus. During these uncertain times, uh, we noticed as a family that we haven't been afraid or scared. And I realized that the bottom line is this, that we have Jesus. And there's really nothing to worry about. That he will handle the things that come before us, come towards us. And so we want to end on this note where only Jesus is the hope for all mankind. Um, so even as we begin, I just want to say a quick word of prayer. Father, we pray that even as we see from your word of how you are, our hope. I pray that each of us here, each of us watching would make you our hope, Lord, that we would lay all our hope on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Even before we get into the word, I just want us to look at the Lumo Project one last time at Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 to 10, just to get a bit of context on what we are celebrating today. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So, um, if I was to ask you, what is hope? What does hope look like to you? Um, I don't know what you would say, but the hope, the definition of hope is this. It's anticipation. It's eagerly waiting for something. And so the, the earliest references to the word hope in the Bible have the, the root word as tikva. So tikva basically means looking in a certain direction expectantly, anticipating something. And um, when you look at biblical references of this word tikva, it's very interesting that the word first came in the book of Joshua. So I'm going to read this verse to you from the book of Joshua, chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. The men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to which you have made us swear. Unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourself into the house, your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. She said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. I want you to just think of the word scarlet cord. When that word is translated in the original Hebrew, it actually was tikwa. So isn't that weird, the word hope and the word cord? So it turns out like English and Hebrew are so different. Hebrew is such a vibrant language where it has so many uh, intonations and so many meanings, unlike the word hope in English, which just has relatively, you know, uh, confined meanings. So the word tikva means hope, but it also means rope or cord. And so the background to this verse was 
where the innkeeper Rahab in certain translations uh, they call her a prostitute she had a dwelling in the land of Canaan and uh, Moses sends 12 spies to the land to check out the land and find out if they could occupy it and they come into Rahab's uh, vicinity and she hides them in the house in exchange um, for the fact that she and her family would be saved when the land is taken over. So she makes a deal with them. They say, sure, we will save you, but you have to hang this scarlet cord outside your window. And so she does that. And what happens eventually is when they come and take over the land, uh, they rescue her and her entire family because of that rope. If you look at the word tikva in that place, it's a tangible thing. It wasn't just some inanimate object. There was a rope hanging on that window. So I'm sure Rahab for the next few weeks as she waited for the conquering of Canaan by the Israelites, every time she saw that rope, she knew her deliverance was close. Also, there was a weight involved. It, not, it was not like Rahab was saved overnight. There was a, a weight before her deliverance happened. And in the same way, our tikva, our hope, it requires a waiting, but it's a tangible thing. We are all waiting and hoping and yearning for a tangible thing, which is only fulfilled in Jesus. So that's why we come back to this. Let me come back to this. This word tikva is what we find in different parts of the Bible. In Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, that very, uh, very well-known verse, which says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you a hope and a future. The word hope there is again tikva. Again, there's in Proverbs 23 verse 18, it says you will have a future hope and it will not be cut off. Same word, tikva again. The basic premise for all of this is this, that we need hope. Hope is tangible. Hope is like that rope. It's something we cling on to. If the hope breaks, there's nothing really to hold on to. And so in Jesus, the scarlet cord, that cord was made real. He is the scarlet cord for us. He's the only hope for all of mankind. So if we were to go back to this, only Jesus, the hope for all mankind, you would ask me, okay, where does this all come in line with all that you've talked about? The point is this, the risen Jesus, you know, the Jesus we're celebrating today, the Jesus who, who triumphed over the grave, he is the reason for all hope. And there were two instances where Jesus was talking to his disciples about his dying and then coming back to life. And then what the purpose of this whole uh, scene was and what the purpose for his entire life's mission was. Um, and so when he was talking to them, there were two things that came out very clearly. Jesus, first of all, said he is the way, the truth and the life. And secondly, Jesus says he was the light of the world. We're going to look at John 14 verses 1 to 6. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The more each of us, um, you know, live on earth at this point of time, it's, it's obvious that all of us are searching for meaning. All of us are searching for something to believe in. And here Jesus was saying, I am the way to the Father. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I'm the only way to life. Jesus' blood, you know what we talked about on Good Friday, where his blood was our atonement. That blood made the way to the Father. That curtain tearing, it was not coincident. It made a way to the Father. He was the truth. I, the more I mull over it, the more I realize that Jesus was the embodiment of truth. He wasn't, truth wasn't an abstract thing. It wasn't a relative thing to him. He was the truth. Everything he said and did matched up. There was no inconsistencies. And finally, he is the life. Jesus himself said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. This is even before he died. And he was telling his disciples through me only, would you have eternal life? And today, all of us here, uh, the, the Bible says, that it, God has set eternity in the hearts of man. So all of us have this huge God-shaped void in our lives that only God can fill. And so Jesus is saying, hey, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So I don't know if you are looking for purpose today, if you are saying, I need more, my life is meant for more. 
Can I urge you to turn your focus back onto Jesus? Maybe you need to turn your focus to Jesus wholly at this point of time. His defeat of death, you know, the enemy's greatest tactic is to hold death before us and scare the daylights out of us. But here Jesus trampled it into the ground. He said no more. Death has lost its sting. And so that was the ultimate triumph. And because of that, we have hope. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we have hope today. The second thing is Jesus said he is the light of the world. I personally love this because have you ever tried dressing in the dark? So this this funny incident happened to me when I was a child. I was about 16. The bunch of cousins, we had all gone for a youth camp. And um, we were, you know, it was very rigid, the, the rules and things. We had to be up at 6.30, be down for breakfast at 7. And then our sessions would start for the whole day. So um, there was no current on the final day of the camp. So we didn't, there was no electricity. So we all kind of woke up. We had cold water baths, got dressed in the dark and ran down for our sessions to begin. Uh, we were about downstairs for about four hours. When at the end of one of the sessions, I was talking to one of the resource people's wives and she looked at my outfit and she said, um, oh, Christine, your, your embroidery on your dress is just brilliant. I've never seen anything like it. And I looked down at, I'm wondering because my dress was really normal and ordinary. So I looked down and to my horror, I had worn my dress inside out. I'd been four hours downstairs wearing an, a kurta inside out. That's what happens when you dress in the dark. We need the light. The light is essential. We all speak so eloquently about the darkness in the world. We talk about poverty. We talk about the stats of human trafficking. We think that um, everything around us is so hopeless that it only gives us the license to talk more and more about it. It makes for great conversation pieces anyway. But can I ask us to stop for a second? Jesus is the light of the world. That is why we have hope today. When Jesus is the light of the world, he lights up every dark space on the planet. We're going to get into John chapter 12, verses 35 to 36. It says this, Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Reading from 1 John Chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the interesting thing is the word light and these connotations comes from the original word phos. P-H-O-S, which is what we get our photosynthesis, those words from. And this kind of light is the highest level of radiance. It's not an ordinary, um, you know, like a tube light or a, or a bulb. This is an incredible amount of radiance. And that that is what Jesus is. And so in the dark pits of the world, where corruption is rampant, where uh, brutality is a norm, only Jesus is the light. No one else can bring the light in. And if you saw in John, there was an interesting thing. It says, when you follow the light, you become children of light. Very often I found that in, in a lot of our friends' lives as well, there's a lot of things that we pray for. God uses us as the answer to our own prayer. So if you've been praying very uh, fervently for the condition and the plight of the poor, very often God will use you as a light in that vicinity. So be prepared. You may be the answer to your own prayer. The point is this, you cannot do good works without the light of the world backing you up. Because without Jesus in the mix, without Jesus in the good works, it's nothing, it's just good works. But when we do something for the poor, when we do something for the downtrodden, when Jesus is with us, when the light of the world illuminates the surroundings we step into, the whole scenario changes. It changes from just good works to God's work. So I urge you today to remember this, that he is the light of the world. Nothing, no situation is too dark for his light to penetrate. So now when we think about it, we've talked about who Jesus is. He is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth and the life. But then for us, we need to look at, you know, steps after this. Now we know this is who Jesus is. But what about us? How are we going to live with hope? Currently, it's, it's, it looks like things are not going to change for some time. It looks like maybe we'll all be in a place of solitude for a little longer. But irrespective of what we are going through, the one constant is this. Jesus is our hope. And I want to just leave you with four things that you can use 
for the rest of this time and then eventually I'm sure it'll become a lifestyle. Hope, the word hope, H-O-P-E. I want us to, just to remember it easy, I'm going to use this as an anagram. I'm going to say H for hold on to Jesus. In this situation of, of a virus, of a pandemic, it's very easy to hold on to news reports. It's very easy to just be on Instagram or Twitter or anything and just be caught up with what's been happening. And you kind of get up and you get, kind of get caught up in, in uh, social media storms. But if we could just still ourselves and hold on to Jesus, I think things would change. Let's look at this passage from Joshua 23 verses 6 to 10, reading from the message version. It says this, now stay strong and steady, obediently do everything written in the book of the revelation of Moses. Don't miss a detail. Don't get mixed up with the nations that are still around. Don't so much as speak the names of their gods or swear by them. And by all means, don't worship or pray to them. Hold tight to God, your God, just as you've done up to now. God has driven out superpower nations before you. And up to now, no one has been able to stand up to you. Think of it. One of you single-handedly putting a thousand on the run because God is God, your God. Because he fights for you just as he promised you. So this is the hope we have in Jesus. This is why we can stay completely calm when the whole world feels upside down. This is why we can trust in this God irrespective of what we're going through. The point is this, you know, our God, he's so close. All we need to do is just hold on to him. I, I often think of how sometimes when we have to cross the road, we grab our children and drag them along because usually they're in a different tangent, you know, so we have to hold their elbow and pull them. But it's so much more easier if our kids give their hands willingly to us to hold on to. And that's what God wants you to do today. He wants you to just lay your hands in his palms and say, Lord, handle this. I can't do it. I tend to get anxious. I tend to get worried. I need more of you. That's the hope we have in Jesus. And this is the thing. Every big detail of your life, be it your job, be it your marriage, be it your children, and the smallest of the small things, that provision that you're lacking, that you maybe can't afford, even those small details, he cares for. He cares so much. He cares about the big and the small. And so I want us to remember that holding on to Jesus is so vital because not only does it provide us what we need, it also gives us an eternity mindset. We live with eternity in mind. Everything that we're having now, everything that we are part of now is temporary. We live with eternity in sight. The second thing is, H was for hold on to God. O is to occupy every space. I want us to read Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. It says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And so this occupying... Uh, every space. I actually um, kind of, you know, took it off what Pastor Karl Lenz writes in his book. He talks about occupying every street and that's kind of his life's motto to make sure that you live every moment with complete commitment to God and to his people and to his kingdom. And we've been talking about kingdom assignment and doing the things God has purposed for us. And so this is directly in line with that. Honestly, now if I say occupy your space, you're going to probably think it's my four bedroom or three bedroom or one bedroom house and and true that is your space but how are you going to occupy that space we can either occupy that space with stress with anxiety with anger with irritation I remember for the first week of the lockdown I was really excited about cooking and cleaning and then the second week I was tired and so I was grumbling I was muttering I was chucking uh, you know vessels loudly into the sink my attitude was pathetic. So here's the thing. When I occupy my space well, when I occupy my space the way God wants me to, I take every task as, God, you're in this with me. I'm not alone. I can do this. Everything I do becomes like an offering to my God. So that space you're in, if it's your house right now, will you commit to spending maybe 15, 20 minutes speaking with your spouse? Maybe you're a single who lives with your parents. Maybe you give them some time. Just talk with them. Ask them how they're doing. Talk about relatives. Ask and check on them. Maybe you need to make phone calls at this time to people you've long since stopped communicating with. Maybe it's a good time to do that. Let me break it down even more. A lot of us in India live in, in flats and apartments where we have watchmen helping us. We have uh, maintenance people helping us. What are we doing for them? They've given up the comfort of their homes to help us. 
Can you maybe make extra given day and provide it for them? Maybe you can check up, even have a conversation with them, check how their families are doing without them. There is so much we must do in the current space we occupy. We can't afford to live. Think Now, I said, let's live with an eternity mindset. Doesn't mean I live thinking, oh, you know what? Eternity is coming. So let me just relax. No, this is not the time for apathy. This is not the time to just lean back and say, I can relax and chill. This is the time when we can sit and live a fulfilled life right within our home. We don't have to have to-do list that is a mile long. All we need to do is be present. If it's your children that need you, give them more time. If it's your parents that need a call and just to check if they're all right, do that. If you can cook a meal for someone who lives just next door who has no one to help, do it. That's how we can occupy our space and live with hope. Until we reach our home in the sky, we must fully occupy the spaces on earth. Because the thing is this, we must love people so deeply and so effortlessly that they experience a bit of heaven on earth through us. So that's the second thing to occupy every space well. And the third thing, P, is to pray at all times. Now, I always, I struggle with a lot of guilt with this because I don't have the time to just sit and pray for long stretches of time. And uh, any other mother would say the same thing. It's difficult to just sit and pray because the minute you sit to pray, somebody comes and calls you for something. Or worse still, um, sometimes when I sit down to pray in the afternoons, I fall asleep because I'm so tired from all the other stuff I've done. So praying at all times is a biblical concept. It says in Ephesians 6 verse 18, it says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. One of my favorite authors, uh, Pastor Mark Batterson, writes this. He talks about ASAP prayers where we say, Lord, I need I need this thing right now. Please help me. And a lot of times God comes through for us. But he also insists that we pray those A-L-A-T prayers. You know what those are? As long as it takes prayers. Sometimes it feels like you're praying for something. You're praying for healing maybe in your own body. Maybe you're praying for a, a life partner. I don't know what you're praying for, but it might feel like your answer has not yet come. But I want to encourage you, travailing prayer, it's a kind of, it's like a woman laboring in childbirth. It takes time, it takes effort, it requires a consistency. And if you're like me and you're not able to just sit for long hours, this is what I can encourage you to do. Pray at all times. Commune with God through the day. When you're cutting vegetables, when you're washing clothes, when you're standing outside and watering the garden, you can keep praying. It's a communication method. It's just talking and talking and talking. A lot of times, though, you need to stay quiet. And that's when he speaks back. He will speak through nature. He will speak through the word of God. He will speak through your children. He will speak through your spouse. But prayer kind of opens up our senses to who God is. And so during seasons of despair, during seasons of where you have no clue what's happening. So the thing about God is he loves hearing us communicate with him. He loves hearing us speak with him. It's almost like he waits to hear us call on him. Your prayers are a conversation with an ever listening God. And your prayers are an expression of your hope in him. In this season, especially, I've prayed a couple of prayers like this. Lord, I don't know how long this lockdown is going to go on for, but give me grace. Give me joy. Help those who are so much less fortunate than me. And the thing is, when you start being grateful, when you start, you know, talking to him as if he's just next to you, the prayers don't stop. The communication doesn't stop. So I want to encourage you, pray at all times. That's your expression of hope to Jesus. And finally, E, endure hardships. The truth is this, if we live in this world, we are going to have trouble. We are going to have hardships. We are going to have setbacks. We're going to have all kinds of things that come against us. But the word of God tells us very clearly in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4, this is what it says. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. I believe that our suffering is a very powerful tool. I believe that uh, you know, um, suffering changes something in us. Whether it changes something in those around us, it changes us. It changes us very often for the better. But here's the thing about suffering. It's like a double-edged sword. It can either demolish your faith or it can build your faith. So you have to choose very wisely how you're going to deal with the suffering. I was recently seeing this. There was this interesting forward that came on WhatsApp. It talked about this too shall pass. And then in, in you know, subtext, it said, it might pass like a kidney stone, but it will pass. 
And so that's how su- suffering sometimes looks to us. It just looks like, Lord, when is this going to end? When am I going to have complete freedom from this particular sickness? When is this financial trouble going to stop? It, it, the end doesn't seem in sight. But here's the thing here. The Bible tells us that it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. There's that word again, hope. That's the point of suffering. So if you are struggling right now, I want to encourage you that your sufferings are temporary. In the light of eternity, all of this is temporary. And he is going to bring something beautifully good out of your struggles and your suffering. It's not wasted. Nothing is wasted with the Lord. When hope is the undergirding factor in our lives, suffering takes on a different shape. We look at it as, God, what do you want to do in my life? What are you changing in me? That's what suffering does. I remember many times um, I have wondered why I had certain setbacks in my life, certain setbacks in health. I didn't understand it at the time. But as time evolved, I saw exactly why God allowed it. He taught me to be sensitive to others with who had the same needs, who had the same brokenness. So things that you are going through right now is not for nothing. There is a purpose to it. So just endure it. Now, when I say endure, I don't mean just grit your teeth and get through it. But find joy even in that. Do the things you love in the midst of your suffering. Find people who will encourage you and speak to you. But the point is this, joyfully persevere through it. For there is going to be perseverance, endurance and hope that comes out of it. When hope guides us, we see our present sufferings as temporary and filled with purpose. So I want to end with this. Will you allow Jesus today? Will you allow Jesus to be the light of your world? Will you allow him to be your way, your truth and your life? Maybe you're looking in different places for peace. Maybe you're looking in different places for for ways to make a difference. But hey, can I ask you to just look back to Jesus at this time? He's the only one who can give you light. He's the only one who can guide you on life's journey. And finally, living with hope. You need to hold on to Jesus. You need to occupy every space. You need to pray at all times and you must endure hardships joyfully. I pray that this Resurrection Sunday will be the beginning of something beautiful. Irrespective of how long you're going to go through this struggle, I believe that God has a plan for each one of us. So I pray that we will live with that hope every single day. That hope will wake us up. Hope will get us through the day. Hope will help us sleep peacefully at night. There is no better time than now to say to Jesus, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I need you. I'm, I'm hopeless. I feel hopeless. I need help. I need hope. I need you. If you are in that place, I urge you to just get down on your knees right now. Or maybe just stand where you are. Or if you're in your bed, just lift your hands up. Can we just pray together? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you. I repent of everything in my life that is not pleasing to you. I pray that you will be the Lord of my life. Come in and make your home with me, Lord. If you're looking right now for hope, if you feel you are lacking hope, if you're looking at at your life through dim and darkened lens of hopelessness, can I pray this prayer for you? Father, I just pray for every person right now who is watching, who is online, who is in a dark pit of despair, who is feeling hopeless, Lord, not just at what's happening in the world, but maybe what's happening with their lives. Father, we just pray that they will put all of their hope in you. I pray they will reach out to you, O Father, because I know you don't disappoint. I know that you don't wash your hands off your people, that you love us so deeply. And so I pray that you will en- enable them to feel your love at this time. I pray they will en- you will enable them to trust you deeper, that they will hold on to you no matter what, Lord. I pray that each of us here would occupy every space that you place us in, even at this time. And that, Lord, we will live our lives worthy of your calling over us. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that hope is what will wake you up in the mornings. Hope is what will get you through your day. And hope is what will help you sleep like a baby at night. I pray that you will have an amazing Resurrection Sunday. And the coming days ahead will be ones filled with hope filled with joy, filled with much purpose. God bless you. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. To hear more messages like this, make sure to subscribe and check out our podcast channel for past episodes. If you like what you are hearing, consider rating us, subscribing 
and even sharing it with friends. That would really help us. For more content from We Are Zion and to connect with us, go to wearezion.in. Remember, whoever finds Jesus finds life.